Thanks so much for having us. It is really nice to be here. It's particularly an honor to be here with you, Judge. I met Judge Abby about six years ago when I was working on a profile of you for The Nation magazine, and knowing you has changed my life, so it means a lot to be here with you. I just want to take a minute to own to note that it's a really heavy time in the world and that some of us gathered here tonight might be feeling a lot of grief or anger or fear. And I, I'm finding it very hard to navigate those feelings on social media. I'm finding it really tricky. And it's just wonderful to be here in person and to connect. So thank you. In light of the suffering that's happening in the Middle East, to me, it feels more important than ever to study histories of oppression, such as this very specific history that I've written in this book. My friend, Sierra Crane Murdoch, she, she wrote about this book. She said, this book shows that our personal stories are inextricable from collective history. And um, I, I loved that she said that. I hadn't thought about that, but I think that's really true. I'm a person who likes to know, like, what, what can I expect about the next hour? So I just, if you're like me, I was just going to lay it out a little. I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. Judge and I are going to talk a little. And then if you all have questions, we'd love to answer them. So, And then there's more nosh and book signing. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. As, as was mentioned, I've been a journalist for a while writing about the American West. And uh, this book starts really at the beginning of my journey of discovery of how my family was entangled to their Lakota neighbors. But it wasn't something I knew growing up, and it took me a long time, kind of an embarrassing long time, to recognize how to understand those, those relationships. And so I'm just going to start at the beginning of that journey of knowing, which uh, is the beginning of the book. 22 years ago, while on a reporting trip to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, I found myself sitting shotgun in a truck with a man who would later become president of the Oglala Sioux tribe. He was smoking weed. When he offered me some, I declined, hoping to indicate a level of professionalism that as a reporter visiting an indigenous community for the first time, I certainly couldn't claim. We had driven off a dirt road and were parked at the top of a rise. Before us were green rolling hills and the flat plains beyond. A herd of buffalo with their dark brown backs dotted the landscape. It is likely that I was wearing jeans and a plain gray t-shirt. Back then, this was more or less my uniform for reporting trips, as I believed that by wearing clothes with limited personality, I could signal to sources that my identity didn't matter. In my bag beside me were a camera, a DAT recorder, and my slim reporter's notebook with the binding at the top. I had one great question prepared that I had learned from a This American Life comic book about how to be a reporter. My boss had told me to write down every single thing that I saw and heard and smelled, but nonetheless, I failed to record whether the man beside me in the truck smoked a pipe or rolled a joint or if he seemed very high or how I felt about any of it. Sitting there in the small cab, the dank cloud of smoke lacing the air between us I was uncomfortable with the quiet. I had yet to learn how to follow a source's lead. I had yet to learn so many things. In my nervousness, I decided to share something about myself. I told him that my family used to own land in South Dakota, that we'd had a ranch somewhere known as Jew Flats. I told him I had an uncle who everyone called Bronco Lou, who could stand on the top of a horse. I remember thinking this might make him see we had something in common that this might endear me to him. He was polite, maybe stoned, and nodded. His smile was thin in a way I couldn't read. It would take me years to realize what my words would immediately mean to any Lakota citizen. The 9-11 attacks had taken place the week before I visited Pine Ridge. One evening while I was there, over a paper plate of food that a family I was visiting shared with me, I said something about the horror of the recent events in New York. 
Sitting beside me, a former AIM activist stared at me, her mouth a flat line. She said, now you know what it feels like to be attacked and invaded. It's about time for Americans to understand how that feels. The day before, an Oglala elder had told me, when I saw those people running through the streets with terror, I was reminded of my ancestors running in fear at Wounded Knee. Even then, I failed to connect certain dots, certain historic realities between her, the Lakota, and myself. All these years later, what stays with me from that reporting trip, what seems now to be the clear central narrative, appeared at the time to be only tangential to the article I was there to write. In 2001, I knew only the major plot points of my family's history in South Dakota. I knew my great-great-grandparents had six children and that they came to America as part of a wave of Jews who fled Russia and its anti-Semitism at the turn of the 20th century. I knew that they, like many other immigrants, received free land from the federal government. I knew their life was hard and strange. The stories that relatives had told me, well-worn from years of retelling, underscored an unfailing tenacity, a specific toughness, as if it were a part of our DNA. One such story goes like this. It's cold because it's winter in South Dakota. My great-great-grandmother, Fega Etka, sent her two, sends her two youngest daughters, one of which was my great-grandmother, the other which is the great-grandmother of a cousin of mine who's here tonight. They were as young as 10 years old, and they were armed with an ax or a log. They were expected to crack the ice-choked eddy of the creek behind the house. Then Fega Etka would dunk herself in that freezing water. That was her mikvah. Another selection from our greatest hits. When one of my ancestors was old enough to look a little bit old, they would write 21 on a piece of paper and slip it inside their shoe. Then they would go into the land office, and the land officer would say, and they would file on their own homestead claim, which would give them their own 160 acres. And the land officer would say, are you of age? And they would say yes, and without lying, they would say, I am over 21. <laughs> that my family handed down these particular stories, selected from the slush pile of history, leaving other more problematic plot lines behind is instructive because, of course, both the stories we choose to tell and our decision not to tell others create the myth we pass to future generations. What follows is my effort to fill in the white space around the edges of those stories that I heard growing up. This is not a definitive history of Native Americans, of the Lakota, of Jewish homesteaders or Jewish immigrants, but it's an entangled history. It's the connective tissue between these histories, the ways they push and pull on one another. I, I think that the way these histories are so often told in silos you miss the depth of the injustice. You miss the way that federal policy, the United States clearly picked certain people to benefit and certain people to be harmed. I've spent my whole career, I started my career at a place called High Country News, and my old boss there used to call it a thinly disguised policy rag. It was about the American West. It still is around. And I really feel like every article I've ever written since then, since leaving and when I was there, is trying to take seemingly very boring bureaucratic policies and laws and show how they play out in the lives of real people and individuals and how they ripple throughout time. And so this book, even though it's a history, it, it doesn't only live in the past. It actually is also told in the contemporary present moment. It toggles back and forth because I feel like I was raised thinking that history was something we're walking away from. But now I really feel like, I write this in the book, I feel like history is tied to this contemporary moment like, like thread through a seam. And, and so it was important to me to show the legacy of what has come before and how it's still impacting this moment now. Quick family history and get you up to speed. So my family, my great-great-grandparents, um, my great-great-grandfather was terribly beaten in a pogrom in Odessa and he goes back to where my family was living in what's today Belarus. And their life there was hard. They couldn't own land like most Jews in the Pale of Settlement. They were restricted from certain jobs. 
and they move like thousands of Jews, maybe many of your own ancestors. They come to America around the turn of the 20th century. And they go, they all end up in Sioux City, Iowa, which was the end of the rail line. And they go there because of, you know, most immigrants go where they know some someone. And there were so many Jews from their part of the pale that there was a synagogue named for the shuttle they came from, Ansha Kapulia. Uh, and I don't know exactly how they found out about the free land, but it's probable that there were posters saying free land or Indian land uh, in the railroads, in the newspapers, and at one point, and so they decide to get in on this freelance, very exciting for them. And what I don't know if my family understood was that this, at the time, the railroads, like was why this land was being given away and, and who it had actually belonged to until quite recently. Um, the, the, the wonderful state of California had been somewhat recently formed and there was an interest in building a rail line linking California and all its natural resources to the rest of the country. Railroads were the most important and powerful corporations of their time and like today, they had a lot of political power. And so the United States and the railroads realize that really to just put that rail line across isn't going to support or pay for that long haul traffic. And the best way to do that is to have little communities living along the rail line. So they have a great interest in making little towns spring up along the way of the railroad. There was problem for the United States. They had two problems. One, there were buffalo that were roaming throughout the prairie. So the United States sets out to exterminate the buffalo and within really a very short period of time, the buffalo, millions and millions of buffalo are decimated. There was a person who said, a, an army general, I think, who said, kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo killed is an Indian gone. Because what they knew was that the Lakota and other Plains nations, um, the buffalo was, well, they thought of themselves as buffalo people, and their whole culture and, and religion was was built around their relationship with the buffalo. And and so I have a map at the beginning. So decimating the buffalo would, would decimate the Lakota. I have a map at the beginning of the book which shows the way that in a very short period of time the United States dispossesses the Lakota of their land. Between 1851 when the Lakota signed the first treaty with the United States and the early 1900s when my family is sowing their first crop on the prairie they lose 98%. They, let's not say it that way. The United States takes or steals 98% of their land. Um, so it was, it was a lot of loss very, very quickly. And one of the things I didn't know about this, about that, and there's so many th amazing things I learned um, while working on this book, but one of them, the most upsetting, was that Hitler was actually very inspired uh, by the way the United States treated Native Americans here. And all sorts of policies. There's a great book called America's, I mean, it, is, it actually is a great book, but it's called uh, The Nazi's American Model. And he shows how, um, I'll just give you a few examples, like Liebenstrom, which was the Nazi Hitler's policy of let's have living space for our Aryan nation and move into these Slavic countries. That was built on Manifest Destiny, which was the United States policy they used to take over the entire West from Native people. Um, and forced you know, starvation and, and crippling people's will through starvation and the taking away of their children, that was, that was totally based on American policy directed toward Native people. Reservations were uh, Hitler's idea of how we make concentration camps. The way I learned this story was, um, I never knew this story. I, I, I was obsessed with the Holocaust growing up. Like I thought I read every book as a 12 year old that I could get my hands on about the Holocaust. And I now have a kid who's obsessed with the Holocaust, it's very unnerving. But, um, but I didn't know until a Lakota elder named Doug Whitebull told me about this history. He called me the day after Holocaust Remembrance Day. At this point, we'd known each other for a little while, and he said, you know, I was, there were these Holocaust survivors on the radio. I was, I was thinking immediately about your family. He said, you know, Americans should contem 
condemn Hitler. It's good they do that, but why doesn't America condemn itself? We had a Holocaust here for 400 years, and no one ever talks about it. And, and what I've learned from my research is that over and over again, it's not just a taking of land, it's, it's, a, it's an effort by the United States to eradicate the culture and religion and tradition, taking away of children from families who are native, so that there is a divorced relationship with land, so that it's possible to take even more land. And at the same time that that is happening, my family is very clearly benefiting, and they're benefiting in two ways. One is very psychological. Um, their, their life on the prairie was, was very hard, but at the same time, um, my great-grandmother and her sister Rose, they always called it the good earth. It meant so much to them that they could own land since they hadn't been able to in Europe, and they felt more American because of this. Um, and so it was, and there's research that's been done in more recent years that show that even for those homesteaders who failed at homesteading, who didn't prove up their land, one of the, the requirements of the Homestead Act was you could get 160 acres. It was yours to keep if you tamed the wild prairie, if you put a structure on the land and you farmed it or ranched it as our family ultimately did. And, and so even for those homesteaders who don't survive, those who are immigrants, particularly Jewish immigrants, they, the experience of being ranchers and farmers, it, it allows them this time to metabolize their suspect immigrant status. They, they quickly feel more American, they have more class as Americans. In Europe, the dividing line is Jew and non-Jew, but they come to America and the dividing line is whiteness, which is graded on a curve. And they, they were still a little suspect. They were white enough to get free land, but they were, um, they, there was still lots of anti-Semitism here. And so being homesteaders was really important to them as their identity. But the other thing they, that it mattered was really in an economic way. I am, as, as you heard, I'm an investigative reporter, so it was important to me to like not just retell the stories but use some investigative journalism tools. So I pulled every deed on every fam on all of our family's land that during the time my family owned the land, we ended up selling our last piece of it in 1970. And when we sold the land, though, by the 1960s, we had about 6,000 acres. Um, and I also pulled every mortgage that my family took out on every piece of that land. I come from a family that really throws nothing away. Like, I have tax returns from 1911. There are nightgowns that are like 100 years old. No one would wear them. Um, but uh, that, like in my Aunt Edda's kitchen where people would like have coats or food, we have boxes of letters and 30-day diaries belonging to my great-grandmother. And I, in my own, I'm the same. In my attic, I have boxes of ephemera. I, I write in here about a school play I was in called How the West Was Really Won. I found the program from 1982. <laughs> um, and so you start to see, when you compare the original family documents with that, those mortgages, how important those mortgages were. Because they would take out a mortgage, and then literally sometimes days later, they would start a new business, or they would move. And it was an economist that I talked to explained that like far more than the value of the land when they sell it, it's that value of those little bits of money over time that really show how valuable it was. I, I used some Excel spreadsheets and I did some math and I had the math checked because I'm bad at math. And, and when you adjust for inflation, it's $1.1 million in mortgages that my family got on that free land. Um, this story is told you know, through my family story, but it's also told through Doug Whitebull's family story. And I wanna show you a photo even though I didn't grow up ever hearing any stories about my family and their relationship with their Lakota neighbors, the nearest reservation was only 13 miles from Jew Flats. Um, but there were these mysterious photographs of my family standing at roadside his stands with Native people. And one of those, and I worked to solve those mysteries in this book as part of this research, and I don't know if you can see, but this man, is my Uncle Jack Sinekin, and he's shaking hand with, hands with a man who's dressed in sort of full regalia. 
And we were always told, there was not really a story, but people had told me that's Chief Red, Red Cloud. It's definitely not. And, um, and the first time in 2019 when I went to visit Standing Rock and Cheyenne River and Pine Ridge as I was beginning my research, a tribal historian said, that's, that looks like Joseph White Bull, who was really famous in his own right. He was this, the nephew of Sitting Bull. And he, there was a whole book written about him in the 30s called Warpath. And, and so because of the relationships I had built while working on a series of stories that was the same series that let me meet Judge, uh, I knew a guy. And I called him up. He's Lakota. He said, oh, yeah, I used to be married to the White Bull family. Let me introduce you. And the, the day I, I showed up and met, I was with my cousin Aviva, and it was June of 2019. And we show up at Doug's house on Standing Rock, and he says, I'm the oldest living descendant of the man in that photograph. And I've spent a lot of time listening to his stories. And, and knowing him has also changed the way I think about the world. So I'm just going to read a little bit from a moment of, you know, that I talked about that land dispossession and how 98% was, was taken or stolen by 1908. But it, it, it's, it's, unending, it's an unending effort to, to take Native land. And it's, it, you see over and over again the, the United States policy. I mean, it's just ongoing. And so when Doug was a child growing up in the 50s, there was a, a series of federal dams put on the Missouri River for flood control. But to put those dams on the river, they did flood certain communities. And the vast majority of those communities that were flooded were Native. Um, they were Native reservations. Some, at least one reservation, 30% of the population of that reservation had to move inland. And, and they're moving away from the river away from the big trees, the big cottonwoods, away from the ability to fish, away, you know, and actually irrigate any gardens they have. Um, and the land they move to is, is almost always much, much less valuable. So Doug's family never were farmers again when they moved inland. Um, and one day we went out and visited the land he's growing up. Thanks so much for listening. One day, Doug, myself, and one of Doug's former students, Jeff McLaughlin, drive out to visit what's left of the place where Doug grew up on the edge of the Missouri River. There aren't any roads to get there. Up and down over buttes, we off-road in an old minivan that Jeff calls his Vuck. It's a truck and a van, get it? He asks me with a quick, shy smile. Jeff, like many former students, calls Doug Lake She, Lakota for uncle. As we near the cut bank far above the deep blue water, red choke cherries and wild plum cluster in the folds and creases of the land. When we reach the grassy slope where Doug used to run barefoot with his sisters, I ask him how it feels. Feels great, feels like home, he says. Swallows swoop through the sky. The air is filled with bird song and the buzz of insects and the river and the wind. But for the moment, I'm not noticing any of that. I'm distracted by our effort to touch the past. An old cemetery fenced off and thick with choke cherry has survived the flood. While it had been slated for removal, the water never got that high, and the feds, by neglect or delay, or delay left it alone. Deep inside the thicket of wild plants are gravestones of Doug's relatives, and he is determined to visit. Getting there will require this blind old man who relies on his cane as if it were a third limb to do the equivalent of bushwhacking. I explain to Doug where to put his foot and how to hold on to my arm and Jeff's arm. I'm embarrassed to share this part, but it's what happened. On the audio file, you can hear my voice asking if this is a good idea, cautioning Doug to be careful. Jeff quietly helps Doug step over the wire fence, gets a camp chair out of the van, and sets it up in the shade in case Doug needs a break. I should have known better. By this point, I knew a lot of Doug's stories, especially his greatest hits, such as the time he, as a teenager, ran a 50-mile race finishing with bloody feet. I knew about his time at boarding school, a place he calls a concentration camp, where he was repeatedly kicked and hit by his teachers, sometimes with a wooden board across his bottom for the crime of not making his bed correctly. I knew that he'd survived all that and become a straight-A student anyway. Not a person given to giving up, 
Doug slowly but steadily traverses the weedy expanse from the van to the graves deep in the middle of the cemetery. He never slows down, never complains. Standing as close as we can get to the old stones, the words in the marble etched in Lakota, I read the inscription aloud to Doug, and he translates, Here was Mary White Bull, who died May 18, 1902, at the age of four. The shade of the choke cherry makes patches across our faces. As Doug takes a moment to contemplate the graves, I'm struck again by the weight of his loss, of what has been taken from him and his family to ensure a specific brand of American progress. There's a debate described in the Talmud between two rabbis over what should be done if it's discovered that a house or even a palace was built using a stolen beam as part of its foundation. One rabbi says the entire building must be demolished so that the beam can be restored to its original owners. The other rabbi, the far more pragmatic, says the building can remain standing if the full value of the beam is repaid. Both rabbis make it clear that as soon as it is known that the beam was stolen, those living in the house must do something. They must make amends. Our country was built on a stolen beam, Rabbi Sharon Browse of Los Angeles said in a 2017 sermon. She goes on to say that to ignore this history and the legacy of this history diminishes the legitimacy and the power of this house, of this nation. Other rabbis talk about the twin original sins in this country, the stealing of native land and the stealing of people's bodies, enslaving of their bodies. The money that has come to the Lakota was arguably never a fair trade for what was happening, what was taken. Rarely a deal negotiated without some degree of coercion. And the losses compound one another. The flooding of Doug's childhood home built on the taking of his father's land and his grandfather's land and his father's before that. And what of everything else that was stolen? The years Doug spent in fear at boarding school, the state mandated destruction of Lakota language, religion, and culture, what payment can be made to replace such a loss? Um, the reason I know that Torah or that Talmud Mudic passage is because of you. <laughs> because before this was even a book, when this was just sort of an idea, and Judge and I had a very long car ride together, and uh, and then a couple days, and I kind of worked up the courage to tell you about this. Maybe I didn't. I mean, I just told you about this idea. And, and do you remember what you said? <laughs> I remember you said, you know, if you're going to look at that, you have to study the Jews. What did the Jews say about how to respond to a harm, even one you didn't directly commit, but one you benefited from? And that actually, I spent then several years studying with my rabbi in Portland, Benjamin Barnett. And we did a process called Havruta, where you study in pairs. And we looked at different places in ancient Jewish texts that talk about atonement and repentance and repair. And, and those are, I, I don't include all of what we learned, but I, I include what I felt like was the most useful. And I'm curious, Judge, you know, why, not to put you on the spot, but why did you tell me to do that? You know, why is, why is justice, why did you say I should study the Jews? Because <laughs> I did, but I'd like to know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? I know. Well, you told me to. I was. Oh. I, I thought you were smart. Who knew? <laughs> no, I, I think the point of it is that the country made a lot of people lose their culture. They tried to take ours, and they tried to take everybody else's. And we all had cultures, and those cultures realized that we were humans, and humans have a lot of faults. And so they gave you ways to, to be and how to how to repair that, and what to do when you made mistakes. And the best thing for me was to say, OK, I, I don't know, but you should look at what your people would tell you to do, because then you will be whole, and you will help others be whole, too. And it also creates a lesson for everyone and to, to remember and to look at the issues when people talk about the melting pot. That isn't the melting pot. That was where they stole everything, you know, where you couldn't have your culture. And I think that's a mistake. And I've thought that for a long time. And I think you have to look at that so you'll know what to do. Because humans, you know, if I, if I had a nickel for every mistake I made, you know, we'd be 
I'd be riding high, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but I don't. You know, so that, that's the nature of the being, and so you have to be prepared to face that, even though sometimes you might not want to, but that's part of being a human, is you accept that with the other things that you get from being human. And I, I did learn, and many of you may know, that teshuva is such a central concept for Jews. It's woven into the fabric of our existence. There's opportunity to consider how to return. You guys may know this, but teshuva is translated often as repentance, but it actually is a word just meaning to return, to return to the inherent goodness of your nature. And, and there's, you know, in the liturgy, I don't do it, but there is opportunity every day to do this. And there are times of the year we do it more. And I mean, and I, it, I, you know, my rabbi said, don't think that everything in the Torah is something to listen to. But still, um, it, it means, it's true. It has meant so much to me to, to apply these teachings. I, I think it's really important, you know, because uh, I think the country also came up with this concept of saying, I'm sorry. Well, in most native languages, there's no words for that because the words don't matter. The actions matter. You have to make it right. And how do you do that? What's your response to the wrong? You know, and so that changes how you approach it. And most people before the Industrial Revolution lived in villages, so they had that same sort of value. You know, they lost it during the course of that other period. But that might have been a mistake. And sometimes when you lose things, you go, oh, I lost it. You know, for us, in our culture here in, in this state, we go, no, we didn't lose it. It went to sleep, and now it's time to wake it up. We, we need to wake up. We need to wake that up and come back to it. You know, it's not lost. Just because you wandered away doesn't mean that it's lost. You were lost. It wasn't lost. I spend a lot of time while working on this book kind of trying to answer the question, did my family know? What did they know? Did they know what was happening nearby on the reservation? And um, at one point I asked you, do you remember what you said? <laughs> you said like, um, of course, everyone knew what was happening to Indians. <laughs> Just, you said everyone knew. And then in the same breath, and this is to me very you, Judge. Like you were very kind and empathetic, and and you sort of immediately gave my dead relatives empathy for their lack of paying attention or do, seemingly doing anything about the realities of having been so oppressed, but then being a part immediately of an oppressive system. And you said, when you're running for your life in fear, you're not stopping to have like a quick restorative justice conversation along the way, you know. <laughs> and um, you said. And that's why this has come to you and your generation, because you didn't have to grow up in trauma or inherited trauma. And you were lucky enough to have like pretty good childhood. My parents' family is here. Pretty good. And so that's why it's my responsibility now. And I wonder if you would could talk a little more about what responsibility can look like for people who are Californians. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very difficult because of the, the history of this country and, and what went on. I mean, for us, the invasion in this state happened, what, 175 years ago. That's not very long. It's not that many generations uh, of people. And for us, within a couple of years of the time that of the invasion, we lost 75% of our population. Um, you know, they were murdered. And it was, that creates a difficulty in inside of you. and. So when, you, when you're looking back, you have to go, well, how, how are we going to do this? What, how are we going to resolve this? And how are the people around us? But part of how it's been resolved is there's no truth. And if you build anything on no truth, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be problematic. And you see the wheels coming off everywhere, you know, because nobody's had the practice of how do you, how do you repair when you've made a mistake. So now the mistakes are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, again. But you can't, you, there's no walking away from it. You know, it's like you said, maybe a couple of generations or whatever, and there's some reasons why you don't. But we've talked a lot about what's your main purpose being in, in this world. And for us, our main purpose is to be a good ancestor. You know, and that changes your responsibilities and how you respond. Because what I do 
like she's having to face that because she has to, if you know, because if you value the truth. And it's the same for me when I make mistakes, you know, who's going to who's going to address them? Because it's all related. You go, okay, well, they're dead. No, they're not dead. They're over this other place now. But dead for many people means it's you know, they're not there. Well, they are there. You know, and we are here and we are related. And that's the nature of humans. And so you have to look at that in a line, you know, and, and go, okay, so what are we going to do with this truth? How are we going to get the truth out? You know, and that's how we became friends is, okay, we're going to talk about the truth. And that's how you form kinship relationships. You know, and it, they don't have to be in the same culture, but they can be a kinship. And then you share that and you sort that out together. And how do you move forward? And that, you know, her friendships with the, with the people there, I mean, they have, in many ways, they, they had the harm, but they also have the ability to forgive. You know, and that's the thing. You can't, you can't exercise those things if you don't talk about it, if you don't be in the same place. Mm. There's this other story that I, I was thinking of when you were talking that has meant a lot to me about taking responsibility. It's from, it's from Deuteronomy, and it's describing pre-Israelites and how what to do if there's a murdered victim, someone that's been murdered and the body is in the middle of the road and no one knows, you can't figure out who killed this person. <clears throat> and there's, what they what Deuteronomy talks about is that the two different towns or villages of pre-Israelites, they would, they would measure their distance to that body. And whoever was, clo whichever community was closer, they would take the responsibility. And that responsibility wasn't just burying the body, it was doing a ritual that would uh, take care of the sin because there was a sense that sin pollutes. You can't just leave it alone. It's going to commute the, pollute the entire community. And, and to, to manage and take responsibility is a collective is a collective endeavor. And Toba Spitzer, who's a rabbi from the East Coast, who's really wonderful, she wrote a sermon, and she said, how do we measure our, how do we each as individuals in America measure our own distance from these harms that were done to Native people and the taking of their land and the efforts to dis destroy their culture. And I, I've come to think that, you know, my distance, because I am the descendant of homesteaders, my distance is a little closer, quite a bit closer to those crimes and harms than, well, certainly to you, Judge, and certainly it's to, to um, someone maybe whose ancestors arrived on slave ships or who came here last week. But there's a really amazing historian, Margaret Jacobs, who wrote a book recently out called After 100 Winters. And she lays it out. She said, anyone living in America today is all benefiting from stolen land. It's the foundation of our highway systems. It's the foundation of our cities. There's so many examples. I include them in the book. Um, and I think if you're interested in, in finding yourself in this story of measuring your own distance, I do have resources in the back of the book that are not, they're not definitive, but they are th some of the resources that helped me when I started doing my research to consider my proximity to this. And, um, and living here in California, there are things where you can figure out, did my family own get a homestead? And what were the treaties that were signed by the United States with California tribes? I mean, Judge, would you tell them if they don't know what happened to those treaties? <laughs> Well, they, we signed them, and they signed them, and then they never passed them through Congress, but we didn't know that. There was another part of the process. So we moved to the land, to the reservations, and they took the rest. You told me once, like, about lying, that, that Native people don't lie, and so, right? Yeah. That, I mean, there's, there's a lot of cultural differences, and you, you get stuck in this situation where for... For us, for thousands of years, for the, all the time we were here before, we just didn't lie. So if you don't know how to spot a liar, you're at a severe disadvantage because there's no expectation that you're going to be lied to. So you can make a lot of mistakes, you know, in, in that in that way. Um, and then you have to come back years later and figure out, okay, what happened here? How did this happen? Because the people that were there said, no, we have this. And then the other people said, no, you, you don't have it. 
mm. you know. And so, and it, it's really about trying to look at those practices and go, all right, part of the problem of being the liar is it impacts you also, the liar. You know, so it isn't just being lied to, it's the lying itself that impacts and then sort of trickles down to everybody. And that's the situation that we're in. So for us, we're, we're the largest surviving tribe in this state. And we survived because we ran and hid. And my message now often is about the fact that that was necessary, and I'm not going to say it was a bad idea, but right now, if we don't come back out and help people learn how to be in this place, that's not going to protect us the next time because it can't, because they have become too destructive. So we have to come back out and say, this is how you are and how you need to be in this place. We have to overcome some of the things that they brought. And it's our responsibility to face those things and to face what we have done wrong in terms of uh, a lot of different practices that we have in community that we're trying to resolve. But we also have to teach the those that came how you be in this place. And if you don't, then this time there's no place to run and hide and we won't make it and neither will they. You know, so that changes how you have to focus things. So that that's a lesson of it because we have a whole way of interrelating to place that they never learned. And if they don't learn that, this is this is quickly turning into a total mess. You know, and we have things that we can help them with their systems, with their judicial systems, with, you know, and that's what I spend a lot of my time on is how do you work with them and how do you try to resolve the issues. And we, in that, we're learning to take care of the mistakes that we've made, the habits that we've picked up, the bad habits that we've picked up. You know, but that's part of the whole lesson is to be in place and your relationship to place and all the things that are in the place and that they never learned that or they forgot it, who knows. But here in this place, they need to learn it or it's not gonna work for anybody. I know that a lot of people talk to me when they hear maybe listening to you right now is bringing this <coughs> up for some people and they hear about this history, they feel guilty. And I'm curious what what you would say about the concept of guilt in the face of this history and the legacy of this history. <laughs> you know, guilt's sort of like, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I'm in the middle of trying to process something with somebody that I wronged clearly, you know, and I could feel guilty or I could think about how to move forward. And, you know, for me. Oh, I think your mic, something's going on. Here, you can take mine. Um, you know, you have to figure out the way forward and the, the best way forward. And I, I don't have any problem with with doing that and going okay well guilt is is one thing but it isn't very practical or it doesn't work for anything and what how, who does it help you know and you have a responsibility to to do do right how do you make it right how do you make it right that's what we spend a lot of our time on is how do you make it right and that's what I'm more interested in doing is making something right than and just feeling guilty you know, because that's not really going to help anybody. I, I think about how I had an excellent education. I really did. And I didn't learn this history. And, and I study, I was reporting on the American West for so long, visiting Native nations and communities. It still took me so long to really know this history. And I'm sure there's still so much more for me to know. And so... I think it's important to remind yourself if you do feel that way, not that it was intentional. You were it was intentional for you not to know this history, and mm -hmm. but I, I love what you said about so get with the program. So you know how do you not get with the program? But how do you what do you do now about that? You know, 
Yeah, I think it's really not about, you know, you take responsibility and it's all about your response to that. What you do learn, what is your response? You know, and to know that there is some responsibility for all of us to to look at the truth. Because without the truth, then you become part of the lie. You're living the lie. <clears throat> Should we let them ask us some questions? Go for it. Okay. Uh, it looks like there'll be people coming around, and you can direct a question to either of us. Oh, I mean, I'm, oh, so you can yes, do we can pass it yeah, around, yeah. Sure, there you go. Oh, yes. Nice. Is this one working? Okay, good. <laughs> Hi. This is a question for Becca. I'm curious about your experience in writing this book and how it felt for you, reflecting on your family and learning these stories or compiling them of just this history that you've accumulated over your time, what that was like for you. I think, you know, it was. it's both, like, part of that truth telling you're talking about. I mean, I had these stories that depicted my relatives in a very particular way, being very religious, very tough, being survivors, always looking so good in all the photographs and very flattering clothing. And to get to know them in a, a different way by, I interviewed sort of every one of my mom's generation and older who might have had a handed down stories and I had thousands of pages of original documents that I went through. There are many people in my family who have like what I call the genealogy gene. So there was a lot of, um, of people who had done a lot of research and I benefited from that. And it was it's hard. It's hard to know your, your ancestors in a re more real way, to see them for their challenging habits and the ways they've not always acted the way they've made mistakes, the way they're more human. And I find it real I found it really freeing because it's helped me have more compassion for myself, for my own living family. That, oh, it's not like they were so good and we're so bad. We're all just people and we all have been making mistakes and learning from them. And um, I don't know, it's it's though that's been that's been helpful. It, it's been hard. There are certain, uh, my Aunt Etta, who is in the book, is uh, 90 years old. She's our family matriarch, and she has struggled at times with me wanting to tell the truth. And it's not about anything. It's sort of been surprising. There's certain things that I describe, and there are so many secrets that I didn't tell, by the way. But I told certain secrets that I felt like were important in understanding ripple, the ripple effect of government action or inaction. So there's things like domestic violence. There's things like illegal activity. There are things that I think are pretty common, actually, when you dig deep in, your, in a family. But, but those are Ashonda for her. And and it's been really hard and really beautiful to see the process of we're very close and we've become closer. And she's gone through feeling really upset with me and feeling so proud and so much love. And she, she wrote me a note right before Yom Kippur and she said, she read the book. I had sent her the, the full copy. I also had given her a copy of the book like a year ago. Um, but to see what it ended up fully being. And she said, thank you for helping me be more of a realist at the age of 90. And I just thought, you know, if, if she can do that, if she can hold two things in her mind at once, both how this is hard and how she loves me and, and she's proud, I, I feel like it gives me hope for the rest of us. Thanks for that question. Okay. Uh, this question is for Judge. Um, what recommendations do you have in terms of um, along the lines of reparations, like public policy, like besides curriculum, like dealing with generational trauma and, you know, just any health issues or specific things that would help like the Native American communities? I think the, the to me, the best thing to do is l like even having this friendship. That's really helped. And so I think you have to know people. And you know, when I said to her, talk to your people, or then talk to the people who are the ancestors of the wronged, you know, that, that's the best thing you can do because there's so much, that, you know, in different places. 
in that specific. And it, the more that you can connect with people and then listen to, to that and then respond to that, you know, and that sounds like you're asking for specifics and I'm not giving it to you, but it is specific because if you talk to people, they'll tell you, this is what, you know, for here, this is what we need, this is what we want, this is what we're trying to do. Like San Francisco's trying to create the first urban um, native village, you know, in, around Friendship House, around that part of the city. And that's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of support from everybody here to do too. It doesn't just grow up and as as you try to do that kind of thing and you know it's sort of like solving the problem little bit by little bit you know when you see it in front of you and that's going to be close here you know and then take that from them and help help do that and and work with that effort. That's you know kind of what I try to do too and you know when we learn certain things that like about the judicial system, and I'll work with partnerships with the local courts and go, let us try this because we've tried it and it works better than what you're doing. And then they do that and it does work better. You know, so it's that kind of thing. They really trust you because you have relationships with them. Yeah, and you, so you have to build the relationships and realize, you know, yeah, there are things to overcome and just in how you overcome yourself, you know, how you things that you have to overcome. I was, when you were talking about your aunt like that was reminding me, I had gone to the medicine woman because I needed to, and she said, well, you, you need to do these certain sets of prayers, and the prayers are to your ancestors. And she said, well, what do you pray to your grandmother? And I said, I don't pray through that door because uh, we ended up having a bad relationship because I didn't like the way that she treated my mother and her sisters. And she said, you have to stop that right now. I said, what do you mean? She said, she did the best she could. You know, and that's the whole thing about your ancestors. It's different. You can see it, then you can look back. But you don't know the whole story. And that's the, that's the rest of the story. They did the best they could. And that's the whole thing about, you know, running and not being able to have a conversation about restorative justice. You have to appreciate that. You know, and then not make that mistake yourself. Um, I read um, an interview with Tori McConnell, who's Karuk and Yurak, and she talked about coming from world repair, a world repair culture. Mm -hmm. And I, as I was walking in today, I saw that language on the wall here too, about the work that is the responsibility of Jewish people to repair the world. And I wondered if you two had talked about that and and the role of, of ceremony or ritual at that intersection. Oh, we've talked about it differently. I mean, we're, we're a r world renewal culture. So all of our dances and much of what we do is is around that theme. Um, you know, and Tori is a very uh, good spokesperson for that. And uh, I always enjoy her a lot. So I'll tell her that she came up in, in our meeting tonight. But, um, you know, and she she is some of the young people who are out there doing that, you know, and you can look to that and go, okay, that's the right way to be. And what I like, she's, uh, she was, I guess you say crowned Native American, Miss Native American for this country. And what I like best about that was she was also named by all the participants, her co-participants as Miss as Miss, I think they call it congeniality. So she won on all of it because that's who she is, you know, and that's her message. And that's, to me, it was very meaningful. But yeah, we have a lot of world renewal responsibility and how you treat the beings in your world. You know, like we were talking this afternoon because she was saying, what should we do this or that? And I'm like, whatever, whatever. You know, and then I said, you know, we're here because of this person, the book, because people, need to understand this book and that's it something too it's it's a living thing these are words and they're living you know and so you it's that that difference you know and this is part of for me is part of world renewal to look at something like this you know, and the message of that and how to how to learn that message 
you know, and our dances are are do that, and that they're uh, they take a lot out of you. <laughs> um, thank you for this uh, presentation, both of you. It sounds like you've um, both explored to going from um, myth making and family stories to truth telling. And I'm wondering, what does it feel like to take that through your family? Do you get resistance in your family when you, when you bring the skills of a, a, of a, a lawyer or investigative journalist to, um, to family stories? And uh, do you get blowback? How does, it, how does it feel? I mean, for me, it's what I probably is, is what I just described in that relational piece. And, but for my family, I, I, I really adore my family. And I would say the love that we have is what it, what is holding. So yeah, there's been some hard conversations, but um, but I think the deep love we have for each other has been what has seen seen you know what's been the final word I think so far. And um, and really, I've had cousins who've said to me, "I just feel so grateful we get to be a part of that. Our family gets to, story gets to be a part of this." bigger effort of thinking about these other issues. So so I, don't, I wouldn't say it's been easy. It's been really hard. And I, I describe that in the book, that it's something I've worried about from the very beginning of working on this project. But um, it, it, it feels like the job is to tell the truth as a journalist. And so, so that is, was what I led with. Yeah. How about you? Well, I think, you know, it's... Um you know, humans think very well of themselves, and that might be a mistake in the first place. But, you know, it's you have to, to look at that, and you have to look at what your responsibility is as a human. It's sort of like looking at, you know, what your responsibility is as salmon or a tree or whatever. It's different, you know, and you have to try to meet that responsibility, and that's, and I think that's kind of what I, try to do and what, what we all try to do is look at that and the truth telling is part of that you know and it, it has its its good points and its bad points but and it's not even the, the myth making it's it's sometimes you realize you know that that was a mistake and you don't want to pass that on but then you can look back and go that's okay because we were human and this is what we've done to make it right or she's making it right for all of them, you know, because then you can do that for your ancestors. That's what I meant in part by being a good ancestor. You know, you part of, you know, somebody's going to have to come along behind me and clean it up, and it's like, oh, well. <laughs> it happens, you know. <laughs> How are we doing? How much time do you, would you say for questions? I think we have one more. I'm so glad you... Or maybe two? Go ahead. All right. We're gonna take one more question. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close. Um, so could we do one more question and then? Yes, Ariel? absolutely. Oh, great. And before we do the last two, I just want to remind everybody that Rebecca is going to be signing at the at the end of the evening, and we'd love for you to stay, buy a book, get it signed, and hang out. Have a cookie. Have another cookie. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, have you had to wrestle at all with, I, I mean, I know people don't usually make tons of money off of books, but, you know, your ancestors um, profited off of uh, land stolen from Native Americans, and, and now you're presumably going, hopefully, I hope you're going to profit in some way off of this story, and, uh, you know, if, if not financially, then by having a platform. Uh, so has that occurred to you at all, like how to wrestle with that question? It, I, yes, a lot. So I haven't really wanted to center this, but since you're asking, um, all the Jewish learning I did and then paired with a lot of conversations with Lakota elders who explained to me kind of how, what's an appropriate way to respond in their culture, and then conversations with Judge Abby, and that led me to come up with the, an idea for how my family could repair. And it's what I call the, our piece of the stolen beam. So Doug, Doug Whitebull, when I was asking him, after we'd known each other quite a while, maybe two years, I asked again. I think I'd already brought it up. 
and he said, you know, remember there's that effort to buy, buy back private land in the Black Hills. And for the Lakota, the Black Hills is their spiritual home. And it was 100% stolen by the United States Army. The, the Supreme Court ruled in 1980 that it was stolen and required a, a big payment to the Lakota who have never taken the money because they don't want the money. They want the land. And so there is now efforts being made to slowly, as private land comes up for sale, buy that land and hold it in trust for all Lakota people to use for ceremony and however they want. And so I've started a family, I, I, I've started a fund at a, an organization called the Indian Land Tenure Foundation that's native led. They've been around for 30 years doing this work. They're amazing. And anyone can donate to this fund. It's called the Hey Sapa Recovery Fund. And I've said our fundraising goal is $1.1 million, which is the amount that we got off those mortgages. Um, I also have done some things differently in terms of um, just how I take responsibility in terms of money. So I I give I make a land acknowledgement in the back of this book, but my indigenous friends have taught me land acknowledgement is great, but there should be some some action behind it. So I've I've made some donations to an, an organization in from the place where I live, Portland, Oregon, uh, that supports Native nations in Oregon, and also to the Buffalo. Intertribal Buffalo Alliance, which specifically for the work the Lakota are doing to bring Buffalo back. And and I've also, um, I've just made some, I'm, I financially given some of the money I've made. I haven't actually talked about this in per, at all, but I, I've, I'm sharing some of the money I got with Doug White Bull as just sort of a thank you for your time. So, um, and it's, it's, you know, how can you ever repay? Like, how could I ever repay judge for our conversations? But, um, it felt important to just, he's struggling, you know, find, and I, I wanted to honor him. So that there's a small amount that I've done for him that way. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yes, I want to introduce Ariel Lukey, who, well, do you want to? Sure. I mean, yeah. here, you work for the Segorte Land Trust. And I'm really, really glad you're here. And he and I connected years ago when I was beginning this project. And our conversations have been really useful to me and helpful. And um, I'm so glad I asked him if he would share with you all the, the really important work that his organization is doing to help the Ohlone people here in San Francisco. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you so much, Judge. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And I've learned a lot and have just been really moved by the conversation tonight. So thank you all. I just want to take a minute um, and introduce myself and talk about um, what you might um, decide to, to plug into right here in the Bay Area around some of these issues. My name is Ariel Lucky. I use he and him pronouns. My people are Ashkenazi, Jewish, Scottish, Irish, Dutch, and English. I also have a family homestead story. My grandfather grew up on a homestead in Wyoming. And um, looking at some of these questions of how our, our family directly benefited materially and psychologically, as you so um, masterfully articulated tonight, um, is what led me into my life work um, here. I grew up in Oakland. I've lived in the Bay Area all my life and um, connected to folks in the Lashawn Ohlone community about 17 years ago, and now work full-time at Segorate Land Trust. Raise your hand if you have heard of Segorate Land Trust. Okay, a handful of people, beautiful. Um, it is an indigenous women-led land trust, an urban land trust based in Oakland in Lashawn Ohlone territory on unceded Lashawn Ohlone land. Um, and the purpose is to reclaim indigenous land. None of the Ohlone tribes here in the Bay are federally recognized. That means there are no reservations. There's no rancherias. There is no land base. And so Segorate is working site by site, you know, lot by lot, and, um, and rematriating the land back into indigenous hands. I work there full time as the development director, and I also am an organizer as a volunteer for a project called Jews on Ohlone Land, organizing in our Jewish communities in the East Bay to get folks to show up in solidarity with Segorate Land Trust. One of the most immediate ways to do that is to pay something called the Shumi land tax. Shumi is the Chochenya word for gift, and it's a voluntary land tax that non-Indigenous 
people who live in Lashon territory are invited to make every year as a part of the kind of repair, as a part of the kind of um, return that Rebecca was talking about earlier. So folks in the East Bay are invited to pay Shumi land tax and all that um, contribution supports the work of Segorate Land Trust. In San Francisco, there's the Unikin Land Trust that supports the Romatush Ohlone tribe that's here on the peninsula. And there are now um, indigenous solidarity land trusts popping up around the country. It's a, been a really meaningful and materially significant way that folks like us who are settlers, who are, who are not indigenous to this land, can support these land back and rematriation efforts that folks are leading on the ground that's actually translating to acre, returned acres to tribes in the East Bay and, and all over the country. So I um, extend an invitation. If you live in the East Bay, in the greater East Bay, come check us out at Jews on Ohlone Land. Um, dot org or you know on the socials and all the things um, definitely check out Segorate Land Trust and um, yeah let's heed this powerful incredible call to um, not just talk about it and think about it but to take action as you both have so beautifully illustrated thank you so much thank you all so much for being here